the cover kind of ruins everything. That's yeah. that's what I call I it. Like you know, I, I I really don't like. I don't really don't understand why this trope of comic book comes around where the cover has the main story, and then you're like, wait, you just what what just happened? So yeah, the cover ruins everything. That's what this is. It's called well, Bloody Pick. I think it's important for us to talk about the context of this. So this was supposed to be the big conclusion of the first part of J.H. Williams and Blackman's plans for this character. It almost gets to be. And then they walk off the comic book at issue 24 before their final chapter, uh, mm-hmm. which because they have a dispute with DC editorial. Now I covered this at the time on my blog because I had been following this comic and the media narrative became that, um, the, media the wedding that should have never happened in the first Right, the media place. narrative was that DC didn't want to let the wedding go forward with um, Maggie Sawyer and Batwoman. And you just saw that we don't think the wedding should have gone forward either. So part of it is like, well, maybe it was just a bad story you were trying to tell, J.H. Williams and, um, and Hayden Blackman. But the other part of that is that was not the only dispute they had with editorial. So we see throughout this arc that they had a long-term plan for Killer Croc, where he has now come back from being the mythological Hydra, and he kind of falls in with these um, the, the creatures of the night that are in Gotham as a crime syndicate, because their leader, Abbott, got turned to stone at the end of the last arc. And, and Croc has now become their default leader. And it's developing Croc as a character. He's like falling in love. He's becoming a leader. He's more than he ever was before. And then DC basically just plucks Killer Croc out of this run and gives him to another writer for their villains month which happened after issue 23 and and took him from the story that was being developed so clearly there was other editorial conflict going on other than just the marriage thing and so it's Mm -hmm. weird that it gets pinned just on that because it's hard it's hard to side with williams and blackman on the marriage plot because it was dumb but there were other things happening Right. And and the thing is, like, and to be honest, though, it shows, I don't know how long ago they knew about it or what was the thing, but it kind of shows in the quality because it becomes a very average, your standard average superhero book that doesn't necessarily have any anything else going on. Like, she gets tasked, deal, like, the best part of this trade was actually the Killer Croc story. That was the best part. And they, uh, the DEO gets and tells her that, oh, you get to get out of it and get you can get Alice or Beth back. Uh, we have Beth and you can get her back if you can find us what's Bruce, like, you know, sorry, Batman's identity. You which, have to spoil it. We don't know who it is. <laughs> I, know, I know. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Oh my God. How could I even? But the thing is, here's the thing. I was looking, I was, okay. So this is me trying to be trying to put logic into comics. So as you know, that I've read the entire New 52 Batman and I read the number of people who knows Batman's identity is staggering. It's really staggering. And the fact that this guy doesn't know it, it's more on him and the fact that he's so dumb than anything. Way too many people in New 52 world knows Batman's identity. I, I, I'm not kidding. Just go back and look at it. Like, there's way too many people that I, know I that. do think that both DC and Marvel, you talk about bad tropes. I think they use the I'm going to tell you my identity now trope so much. And then they're always trying to put that damn genie back in the bottle. And it's like, how about you stop using the trope so much if you're trying to spend all of your narrative time putting the genie back in the bottle? And for and- me, the perfect example was in this run where we have Batwoman in a room with like her dad, Maggie Sawyer, Bet, uh, her dad's wife, her stepmother, th- and the DEO. Like, how ha- we've gone from her and the Colonel operating as this twosome to like half a dozen characters knowing it, which doesn't even count Batman himself knowing right. who she is. And it kind of just it made me like take it took me out of it because I'm like, yep, this is where we are because this is where all superhero comics go. There's no super secret identity that's really secret. Uh, right, and the thing yeah. is, like, that's that's the thing. Like, I'm like, that's uh, that's one of the things. I'm like, just ask the kid who had him. Like, he becomes, I think, later on, Duke Thomas. I'm like, just find Duke Thomas. Just find, just just find him. Like, there is like so many people in New Fifty Two World knows Batman's identity. That at this, I was actually worried for him. At one point, I'm like, I'm worried for him. Joker yeah. knows who Batman is. Joker knows it. Yeah, that's like, that's. 
And the thing is, I'm like, and that's what I'm like, okay, you you are just a dumb dumb now. I'm sorry, sir. There's nothing. You look like you, you're a skeleton. I get it. That's your gimmick, but you are a dumb dumb. Like, well, uh, I, so I want to, uh, I want to take a step back. So the, the finding out Batman's identity is ultimately an end game in this arc. The, the arc basically is that DEO plays their last card that they have to hang over Batwoman, which right. is that they've got her sister. And they've tried all these ways to control her. And she keeps like subtly slipping out of her control. Like she doesn't kill the people they want her to kill in the second arc. In the third arc, she like go, you know, goes off the reservation with Wonder Woman and breaks her communicator that had been recording all of her interactions with Wonder Woman. And the DO has had enough at this point. And they're like, look, here's your choices. You can either do what we're asking here and get us Batman's identity and we'll give you your sister back or screw you and we'll put you, your dad in jail and get rid of you and we'll find somebody else to do the same thing, possibly your cousin Bet, and we're going to get what we want anyway. So can you finally please just play along with us? And right. you, you said that you thought the Killer Croc issue was the best issue and you thought this was kind of standard superhero fare. I have to say, I, we're, we're going to have a rare disagreement because I actually kind of liked that we were back to normal superhero fare. It felt like finally we're seeing Batwoman be Batwoman. Like we kind of swept all the supernatural stuff off the off the plate and we get this really fun fight with her and, and Mr. Freeze. We get her having to have a confrontation with Bane. Whether or not they were under an editorial direction to make Batwoman more like Batman or not, I don't know. But it just felt like a little bit of a relief to me of like, okay, she, she's actually pretty good at this Bat person thing. Um, and, and it actually made me really like this arc in a way probably the most out of all four of the arcs we've read on this book, because it felt like the Batwoman book I thought I was signing up for when I read the Rucka. I think the reason I didn't feel that way, because I knew this is the end, mm-hmm. because I knew that, you know, what was the, what's the point? And the, the thing, the, what I really like, I, I don't know, maybe it's, it's me, it's on me. It's not anyone else. But the thing is like, I often, I'm like, we know that that, never gonna happen we know that that she will end up working with batman and never give up the identity we know that she's gonna save beth so what's the point like, right you, you get to a point where like the narrative force of things we know to to have to happen it right. becomes so right. strong that it starts to disarm the narrative and it's like the only option is either the narrative completely goes off the rails and does something unexpected but then a lot of readers go like you can't do that or it does the expected thing but you kind of feel like you just check out because you're like this we're just like rolling down the hill at this point right. and these and characters don't have any choices to make and the thing is like here's the thing the end of the last trade it ends with like uh, with bones saying that you have our sister's eyes to Beth and that was like, oh no, what's going on? And I honestly thought that this is going to be exploring that. Like we're going to finally find out what's up with Bones or what's happening there. Because at no point before then, there was a brother that was mentioned. So... Yeah, and the colonel actually says at some point to the step what the stepmother, I think I have a son. So like... I, what, they, hey, hang on, hang on. Here's, yeah, hang no, on, here's please, the thing. No, no, no. Was that a joke? He said it as a joke. Did he? Yes, he said it as a joke. Because the thing is, if you read the annual, you will know all of these things get undone. So that's the thing. He said he said it as a joke, you know, in the sense like I've seen that joke in some other places. Like, oh, now you're gonna have to tell me all the secret because you know it's like it does a narrative. Like it's like a it's a trope. It's a new trope now that you find out. Oh no, she's actually on board because the previous bad trope was she would never be on tro- on on board with it. But now the new trope is like, oh, I'm gonna be on board, and then you know, and it's like, oh, so do you have any other secret to share? Or, oh, I have another child. It's 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 a I don't, it's, I don't a, know. it's a I joke. I agree with you that it's a, here's the thing because um, Williams and and Blackman walked off this run. It has to be resolved in the annual, which is not in this collection. It's in the next collection, weirdly, probably for like a royalties right. thing of like not putting something in this by a different writer. And it's resolved by the next writer who has to tie up things the best that he can. But I think editorial probably gave him some notes of like, here's the things you can do. He, like send Alice off into the right. sunset. Here's the things you can't do. And one of the can'ts was get too much into the thing with Bones and her dad and whatever. So... I, I don't know if I fully believe it's a joke. I think that we have to characterize it as a joke because there's nowhere else it could go. It kind of reminds me of, in a positive and a negative way, of like 80s X-Men, where Chris Claremont was in control for so long that he could just right. drop these little hints because he knew that he would pay them off like 
five years later. But then yeah. X-Men tried to keep doing that in the early 90s because that was the style of X-Men to just drop these little hints everywhere. So they dropped the hint about the X-Trader and they dropped the hint about the Summers brother. But it, they couldn't be fulfilled the right way because they didn't have the longevity of the writers on the book to like really dig in and, and fulfill those, um, those hints. And so then they sort of just become these like volleyballs that are being bounced back and forth between the writers and they lose and they lose their impact. So, you know, it took decades for the Summers brother thing to work. That actually turned out well. But like the X Trader thing kind of gets corrupted into Onslaught and um, the 12 just kind of sputters out in an awful story because there's no consistency and you just have editors being like, hey, you should resolve that one. And that's a lot what this felt like to me. Like it just felt like Jage Williams and Blackman were setting up a long game here that okay. didn't all have to get resolved at the end of this arc, but then it did. And, and so that even adds to the this doesn't even count feeling you get as you're reading this book because it's it just doesn't get paid off the way that it should have. Okay. Because the thing is like, you know, um, we're going to spoil, we, we can spoil the annual yeah. because in the annual it showed out, it turned out that it was, it was just, uh, he was just a fanatic. Yeah, and Bones he, is just obsessed with the colonel. Over time yeah, he's decided is, the colonel is his dad. Right, Colin is his father, which is like, why? What's so special about this guy? Like, yeah. I would understand. Like, you know how it's like, you know, in the Court of Owls, we had that um, Talon uh, or whatever his name is. He decide he decide, he fought, fought, he got, becomes uh, delusional to believe that he was Batman's uh, Bruce Wayne's brother. Yeah. Like, I understand that. Okay, Bruce Wayne, Batman. You know, Wayne family. Ooh, what is about? What about this call now? Like, why? Like, yeah. you know, I I didn't. I didn't understand that. I'm like, okay, who is this guy that you were obsessing with? So unless there was like a, as you said, like, you know, maybe Colonel is not who we think he is or whatever else is going on. It's, uh, it's one of those, like, you know, one of those things we'll never know. Yeah. Here's, so here's the one other interesting thing that I think this run did is that it lets Batwoman be a tactician. Like, not in the smartest way, but she, no. they're telling her to defeat Batman. And she's like, well, I don't know how to do that. Like Batman's been doing this a longer time than me. I can't go head to head with him. But she sort of works with Chase to conceive of this idea of what if we interview all of his villains and we kind of like try to understand why they throw themselves up against this wall of Batman over and over again. And we try that to- was a fun thing. Yeah, and we and we try to like derive some kind of learnings from this, and so you th it comes off as like a little bit um, perfunctory when you're first reading it. Like, okay, she's gonna fight Bane. That's gonna be fun. Oh, she's gonna like interview all these villains. Okay, I guess that's cute. But what you realize by the end is that this is part of Batwoman's strategy. It's methodical. It is military based. She's like, I'm gonna like take a look at all of the ways that Batman has succeeded. In the past, and try to extrapolate how to make him fail. And so they're in Arkham, like interviewing all these B grade Batman villains, right? Not the ones they eventually set loose, which tends to, is more A grade because it's like Ivy and people like right. that. But it actually um, it works for me that a hero has kind of decided to use Batman's villains against him. And honestly, if Batwoman didn't have that little kernel of empathy and caring in the middle of her at the end of it here, I think I think really she could have defeated Batman. Like I know that nobody likes to think that Bat Batman can get beat by anybody and he can beat any other hero. But I really think she has him on the ropes because she was using a strategy and resources that doesn't usually get applied to Batman um, because people are treating him like the hero. But she knows he's not a hero. She knows he's she's just like he's just like her. And so he's she's just doing the thing that would defeat her, but to him. And I think it's really effective and interesting. Yeah, but and the thing is, like, though, if you look at the last last page of this of this run, uh, you know, by that's the last one by J.H. William, you'd think that that's what they were probably setting up for. Yeah, because it was, you know, it ended with like, you know, Kate's hand, like, you know, they're both like with their hands on the, each other's throat, and I think that that's the way it would have gone. That Batman would finally, you know, find like, you know, be risk, like, you know, find someone worthy of his opponent. Yeah. And you get a little bit of that in the annual where they kind of come to a little bit of an agreement, but it's it's not right. as satisfying. So here oh. we are at the end of this J.H. Williams run. It's 24 regular issues and two zero issues. Um, and it's been quite a ride. It's not the same as the Rucka run, but it does do some interesting things for a character. So where do you feel like you are now with this Batwoman character? What do you feel like you know about her? What do you still want to see her do? So um, I think... 
and that's where we're going to go into with the rebirth is that i what i learned about that she's she's a very flawed character which i always uh, always uh, you know um always like and the fact what i would like to see her is be more involved with the bat family because you know the thing is that if if she, she after all she's batwoman she has the bat in front of her name and so she has to be involved with the bat family somehow i i would rather see just issue after issue of like her going on doing some adventure with nightwing her go doing an adventure with barbara gordon or her doing some adventure with commissioner gordon even you know i would like to see more of that um and i don't know whether like you know i think from what i've heard that detective comics rebirth is kind of goes into that direction Am I wrong? No, you're totally right. And, and I think okay. she's an interesting point here. And I forget if it's in this arc or the last one. I think it's in this one where somebody says to her, well, you're wearing his bat. And she says, it's not his bat. It's, it's, right. I, it's the symbol and I've chosen to use it. And exactly. That dynamic never goes away. Even though she becomes tighter with the bat family, you mentioned at the beginning of this read that you first met her as she's being called to be like a fill-in Batman um, right. during some part in Batman Eternal. Like she gets accepted into the family, but she's not really their family. And she, she oh, there's always this idea that Kate Kane has her own idea of what the bat means, should mean, and should accomplish. And that becomes the main theme of Detective Comics Rebirth is the ideological divide between what the bat means between Batman, Batwoman, and also to a degree between Tim Drake as Red Robin and the and the pull between the three of them of what does the bat mean? And it's um it's fantastic. And and that's a that's a completely, you know, completely valid way of looking at it. That it's like, yes, because if you're in Gotham, Batman is now more than a person. It's a symbol that has been dri drilled into our head in the especially in the modern run uh, since New 52 era. Uh, that you know, in, that was one of the uh, one of the thesis statement of Snyder's run as well. But the thing is, it doesn't make sense if she's telling that to herself. She needs to be, you know, she needs to uh, confront other Bat family and then kind of discuss it with them because then it becomes a little bit more understand. Like you know, you understand it more. If some yeah. random guy, random guy out in the street, like, oh, you know, Batman means this to me. Who cares, dude? Like, you know, cool story, bro, but no one cares. You need to have the discussion with the Bat family and she needs to be put into contrast with them. So far, we haven't seen that. And that, so I'm kind of excited about Detective Comics to kind of understand that a little bit more. Yeah, you know, for me, that was ultimately a weakness of this run, which is I, I'm not the biggest Batman fan. So I didn't go into this run saying like, well, I need to see her hang out with Batman. I was happy that it didn't cross over into things like death in the family because I didn't I didn't want to care about all that. I just wanted to read about Batwoman. But ultimately, I think at the end of this run, I came to the realization of exactly what Faria just said, which is that you need the contrast. Like you can't have this character operating in a vacuum in Gotham because that's not what Gotham is. Even Go right. Gotham Central, you know, which was an amazing series we've name checked a couple of times you should read it if you never have which never like crosses over directly with batman but it's clear that it exists in the spaces inside of a batman world of god right and i don't I think that i don't think that batwoman ever really got there until the end of this arc and i think if you're going to have a batwoman that has nothing to do with batman and gotham take her out of gotham then um right and and i think that's why detective comics and rebirth resonates with me so much because that ex it gives us that exact thing it's like okay let's see what happens if we actually put her next to batman and we explore the difference between these two characters so that's what we'll talk about next week and and the thing is again it's a good progression though because you know okay you she she appeared when batman wasn't there now she kind of did her own thing in new 52 now you come to rebirth and then now you put her into the bat family and then see how that shakes out so it's i think it's a good character progression to me at yeah. least like in, if, if it was always this like oh she's operating in vacuum and the, because even in the last ra last trade when they were like they had all medusa showing up and stuff i couldn't help but think where's batman or where's bad family I i'm sorry like you know as much as like yeah sure i want her to be her own character and doing her own thing but she has like you know she's in gotham and uh, so where's batman like yeah. you know it's uh, it's something that kind of comes in your subconsciously so well, yeah. we're going to be exploring that next week. So there are trades that come after this in the new 52 run. We're not reading them. Uh, they definitely explore more of good. 
yeah, they're not great. They explore more of Batwoman as kind of a um, supernatural Bat character. And it, it's, I think it takes her a little bit too far into Batwoman as an agent of the supernatural to a point that she actually becomes a literal vampire at one point. So what? you certainly, can, yeah, I'm not joking. So you can <laughs> read them. Um, you don't need to read them to appreciate where she winds up in rebirth. So if you want to know everything that Batwoman has ever done in her life, my Batwoman guide has every Batwoman appearance up through rebirth. And you can go and investigate that but she starts out in rebirth appearing in detective comics that's where we're going to pick up next week we're going to read the first arc of detective comics then we're going to read a little bit to a little two issue arc that's called um batwoman rebirth or batwoman reborn and then we're actually going to read the first arc in her batwoman title that started in 2017 written by marguerite bennett and with um the amazing steve efting on art freya has it there i have only read it visually there it is. Here we go. They, look at this. This is amazing. I remember seeing this. I'm like, oh, what is this about? I want to read that. You know, I didn't know much. That I didn't know about much. I didn't know that she's Batwoman. I thought that it's some, like, you know, some new, um, new DC character. But I was like, I want to read this. Who is this? And yes, it's amazing. Amazing cover. Yeah, and I will say as um, incentive, if you haven't read this yet and you want to just pick it up digitally, if you don't have the time to order it physically by then, um, Detective Comics is not only my favorite DC book of Rebirth, neck and neck with Deathstroke, but possibly my favorite, but it might be my favorite um, big two comic book of all of 2016 and 2017. So it's that good. Wow. I'm not gonna say anything else. And it's not, it's not X-Men. And it's like, not you know, X-Men. It is what an X-Men comic should be, but starring the Batman cast. So that's where we're going to leave you this week. Thank you so much oh for watching God. our discussion of Batwoman Book Club Week 3. Come back for, with us next week for re Week 4 to see what we have in store. And if Faria agrees with me, the Detective Comics is the best of DC Rebirth. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Bye.